Real Churches Coach. Back in 2004, I was teaching a church planning course at New Life Bible College in Moscow, Russia. And um, we were focusing on church planting, and we were looking also at how churches grow and develop. And I asked the class of about 14 people, if you could ask God for one thing as you start your ministry of planting a new church, what would that be? And the people thought about it, and one woman said, I would ask God for eternal life. And I said to her gently, well, you're a Christian, right? Yes. Well, why would you ask God for something you already have? Because John chapter 17, verse 3 says that now this is eternal life, to know the Father in heaven and the one that he has sent. So when we have Christ, who is eternal life, we have eternal life. I asked, what would somebody else say? One young man said, I would ask God for humility and holiness. And I thought, that young man has a lot of promise. That's a very good answer. Another person said, I would ask God for a really good plan. Another person said, I would ask God for a team of people that would work with me. And all of those were really good answers. But I said, I want to suggest to you an even better request, a number one request in ministry that we should ask God for. And that is to ask God for a Barnabas. In the New Testament, one of the most important people is Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And the first reference to him is in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. This is where we are introduced to Barnabas. The church is young. It's a baby church. It's just starting to grow in the city of Jerusalem. And scripture says that Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. So here's a man whose name was changed to really his spiritual gift. He, among all the people in the New Testament, characterizes the spiritual gift of encouragement. And he also shows us the essence of what it means to be a good coach. Because a coach is the same thing I'm using here for an encourager. The word encouragement is a combination of two Greek words. One is para which means to come alongside, parallel. And the other is kaleo, which means to call to or speak to the person who's alongside of you. And so the word encouragement means to side by side, shoulder to shoulder. The image is two peers, the, the person with a gift of encouragement walking side by side, not above, as some kind of a coach who is dictating or demanding and not above is some kind of a slave, but side by side an encourager is a person who calls out, speaks clearly, and that's what we're going to call coaching. 
It's the skill of being a Barnabas. And we all need a Barnabas. We all need a coach. And this is a skill set that we can develop that will really help us in our ministry so that we can be a Barnabas and we can ask God to give us a Barnabas. So what I'd like to do is describe what is called the five R's of coaching. And this was uh, not developed by me. It was developed by a number of different people. Uh, one is Bob Logan and others uh, in America have written books on this. And now this is used all over the world, this idea of being a coach, of being a Barnabas. And the first dimension of this, the first R, if you will, is that we have to relate. A Barnabas always builds a personal relationship with the person that they're working with. So they're not some kind of a distant, demanding coach like on a sports team that none of the players know. That's not what, we're mean, that's not what we mean here. We mean somebody who's coming alongside and building a strong personal relationship. This word, again, uh, parakaleo, um, talks about, is used in the New Testament to describe the Holy Spirit. He is called the counselor, the paraclete. Same Greek word, to come alongside, to coach us. Do you realize that you do have a coach? That the Holy Spirit is our coach? That we are never without a coach when we have the Holy Spirit in our heart? And yet we also need a person like Barnabas in our life. This word is also one of the spiritual gifts of Romans 12. It's also a word that's used in 1 Peter 5 for how Peter says that, I appeal to you, I encourage you as an elder to elder. This is how to be an elder, he describes in 1 Peter chapter 5. So it's how elders are to speak to each other and relate to each other. How leaders are to be side by side and not thinking that they're better or above everybody else. And it's also used in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, where Paul says to Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him, encourage him as if he were your father. The young man speaks to a father with respect not in a harsh, demanding way. And that's also the nature of this word, and it's the nature of the kind of relationship that we really need. We all need a Barnabas. We all need a coach. We have one in the Holy Spirit, but we also need one that walks alongside us. And so to pray for a Barnabas is very important. And there's someone who cares about us, and we care about them. We build a personal relationship with them. So that's the first R of coaching. It all starts with building a strong personal relationship. And then the second R of coaching is that the role of a coach is to help the person that they're walking side by side with reflect on what God is doing in their life. Now, this is very important, again, to remember the distinction. A coach here is not one somebody who says, okay, now you do this, and you do that, and you do this, and you do that. It's really the opposite. This kind of a coach is the kind of person who asks great questions to help a person reflect on what God is doing, rather than always telling them. That's why with my adult children who are in their 30s and late 20s, this is what I do all the time with them. When we're on the phone, I might ask them a question like, you know, what's something that God's been teaching you? I might ask them, you know, as you've been reading God's word, what's something that you've been learning lately? I might ask them when they go through a difficult situation, you know, what do you think the lesson there was? I'm trying to help them to reflect on what God is trying to teach them as I listen and as I ask great questions. Gaining perspective is the central task of this stage. It helps us understand the reality of our situation, where I am, what I'm dealing with. And individuals answer for themselves and reflect 
Bob Logan in his book on Coaching 101. And someone else re has, re has observed Norm Shabchuk in his book on Managing the Congregation that one of the causes of an ineffective manager or businessman or student or pastor at the root is that they do not reflect on what's happening in their life and they're not learning. They're just in a rut. It's like that sign in the north that said, be careful what rut you choose, you'll be in it for the next thousand kilometers. And so some people live in a rut and one of the things that reflection does is it helps us to see, to see that we need to do what is called now in America, a very popular word, to pivot. We've been heading this direction, but now we need to change direction. And we begin to see that as we, re as we reflect that the decision that we've been going is not bearing fruit, it's not accomplishing things, and it's time for a change. That happens through reflection. And a Barnabas will come alongside of us and help us to see that it's time to pivot. It's time for a change, but they don't tell us what it is. They just help us to reflect that this is where we are. This is what God's doing. In the life of Barnabas in the book of Acts, we see that Paul helped the apostles reflect on something in Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, we read, when Paul who was Saul and was persecuting the Christians, came to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus, he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. You see, Barnabas was able to come alongside Paul. He was willing to take a risk of a personal relationship. He was even willing to take a risk of bringing Saul in to meet the other apostles. And that's one of the, the things that a Barnabas does. They're willing to risk things to help people reflect on what God is really doing rather than just staying in a rut of rejecting Saul when really they needed to pivot and build a relationship with him. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.